Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Diane Floyd Bone on today's show. Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show. I'm your host, author Diane Floyd Bame. Tonight's guest is author Dr. Kenneth Andres. Welcome, Dr. Kenneth. Daddy, and uh, I probably should say aloha since it's two o'clock in the afternoon here and another beautiful day in paradise. So uh, you're so blessed. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, well, I'm just delighted to, that you're able to reach out and and uh, so we have an opportunity to discuss some of my books or anything else that happens to come up. Well, I am so happy to have you here and I'm very honored to um, speak with you and interview you and I want to thank you for your service. So with that, maybe we can start with you telling a little bit about yourself before we dive into your books. Alrighty. Well, I'll try to get the brief thumbnail here. I was uh, born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, in so Ohio, one up in the Navy is still kind of is uh, at a loss for me, but the uh, but I went to Marietta College and uh, right on the Ohio River, and it was just a, a wonderful experience. And uh, I hadn't realized at the time, but my my mandatory freshman composition class actually got me going on this route. And I say at the time, I didn't even realize it. And uh, then after college, I went to the Ohio State University School of Medicine, where I got my degree there and did my training at the Naval Hospital of Portsmouth where I got my uh, specialty in internal medicine. And from then I headed to the fleet. Actually, before I went to the, got my residency, I spent, uh, God, it was three years in the fleet. So I got the end of Vietnam with the evacuation of Vietnam. And uh, and I spent, a, I was with the Marines without outfit and the future Commandant of the Marine Corps is my boss, Al Gray. And uh, so I had an opportunity to meet some just amazing uh, individuals. And then I was on the uh, nuclear powered cruiser, the USS Truxton. And uh -huh. uh, so we went out to the Indian Ocean and uh, actually most of that cruise eight months was kind of boring. It was just kind of steaming around in circles. It was, we called our task group as the nuclear power task group and we labeled it NPDG, no place to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, any rate, uh, so getting back then and after that, I, I uh, got back into uh, clinical medicine and alternated uh, clinical medicine tours and operational tours. And uh, the one that actually got me launched on my books a little bit was actually the Desert Storm, Desert Shield. And uh, and I was kind of looking around and telling myself, man, there's an awful lot of stuff going on here that people just don't have a clue about. And uh, sort of the stuff that goes behind the scenes, all the decisions for the presidential level you know, all the way down to the operational level. And so years later, when I was at the uh, Pacific Fleet as a fleet surgeon, I started making notes on the uh, on the South China Sea. I said, most people have no idea where the South China Sea is. Oh, south of China? Well, yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I decided to write a, uh, uh, a book about uh, what would happen if the US and China backed into a almost conflict. And so that, so I started making notes on that back when I was still on active duty and uh, having no idea what I was actually getting myself into. Right. And following that, I had a, a few years of uh, in a medical group, which I, after the military, having a medical group was, was pretty tough. The, the whole focus of medical care was just totally different. And uh, so then I uh, joined the VA for 12 years and transferred back out to Hawaii and, and we're not moving. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you, you are now, happy. I look over my left shoulder and I can see Diamond Head to my right in that direction and then off my left shoulder is Cocoa Head. And uh, that's so lovely. It's just, yeah, it's great. Can't be so there. you mentioned earlier it was one of your freshman classes, a composition course that you took that kind of opened up the perspective writing for you. Is that correct? That's right. And uh, you know, Merritt, it was a it was really a, a small school. It was actually smaller than my high school. You know, it was a liberal arts college, and so as a uh, as a uh, biology major, I did get a liberal arts education. My favorite classes actually were art history, and uh, we had a, a two semester course on the concerto of all things. So that was a nice mental break from all the science stuff we had to do. And uh, 
but then you know i i i, I look back and some of the stuff i wrote and i said oh my goodness but what marietta did it taught me to write and to think and uh and so it and gave that, you that foundation right exactly and so that was uh just incredibly important no matter what i did i i just can't emphasize enough of just learning how to be able to express yourself you know obviously verbally i actually had a uh, yeah, speech course I had to take too, which right. <laughs> was really traumatic for this shy kid. <laughs> I think for yeah. all of us, uh, those classes are so important because no matter in what walk of life we have, the art of communication, whether the word um, speaking or writing is very important. But would you say you've always been a storyteller? Or was this something um, new you were discovering in the South I, I, <laughs> See, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to think about that, and I guess probably, and and that may go back to you know just growing up, especially in high school, you know just you know, I just love to read, and kind of immerse myself into a a good book, and and of course like most folks say you can kind of lose yourself in a a really compelling story, and so back in the day I read all the Alan Jury books, uh, my interest in the sea, so I got Horatio Hornblower and all those seafaring stories, which in retrospect, I've reread all of them and they were just really well written. I, I just now, you know, about 10 pages left in the source, I decided to bite the bullet and, uh, and plow through all 1300 pages of Michener's The Source. And, uh -huh. uh, and my goodness, that was something. The other thing I had done, I kind of punished myself as Anne Rand's. I read one of hers again. And I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> and so it's anyway, amazing it's, how much she was on the point. My mom made me read those books. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, my condolences. <laughs> I know so, it's kind of scary. <laughs> really good, but you know, she'd get in this big descriptions of things, and I'd say I'd tell myself that, oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> <It's a page. laughs> but, well, uh, I'm glad you're sure. writing your books. Yeah. One of the books I saw that you wrote was, uh, which I got a kick out of and wish my husband would have, and I would have known about it, was that congratulations, your daughter's getting married. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> that was, uh, that was a, a, a really interesting project. And, and, and I guess I just going into that, my daughter's one, I have two daughters, and, and, uh, and I was just absolutely clueless. I used to tell my wife, I said, well, I guess when the kids get married, I'll just be an emotional basket case. And of course, I had no idea that was going to be the case. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was just uh, just a wreck. I was just, as I said in the book, I was just laying in ruin <laughs> after the wedding. I was just emotionally and physically exhausted after number one. And this is after my wife warned me this had happened. And of course, you know, as that's a guy thing, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> and of course. She was on point. And anyway, so after the winning, again, I just do my compulsive stuff. I started kind of making notes to, to myself and looking around. And I said, you know, most dads are clueless about what happens when their daughter gets married. You know, it's the wedding, but also what happens to them because it's such a major life transition mm -hmm. and for both the father and his daughter. And, uh, and so kind of weaving your way through the shoals of uh, is was really something else. And so I decided to start scratching down, you know, what that was like. And, uh, you know, I said one of the chapters, I think, was if all else fails, read the directions. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, so that was that was really uh, that was an interesting project. And then the other part of that I was looking through and I really couldn't find much about on the father of the bride's viewpoint of all this and uh, usually what showed up online was uh, well you know you got the father of the bride speech you don't screw it up and embarrass your daughter you know uh, you know make sure that you, you know you got to pay for the wedding i mean there's just some really basic stuff basic. Here, really including on. watching the movie father of the bride Yep, yep. <laughs> so I'd done that. And, you know, and that was interesting. There's, there's a little more to that part of the bride stuff. That was one of your typical kind of yuck, 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 funny movies, which kind of tongue in cheek kind of glossed over the major emotional stuff, mm -hmm. which is what the dad is really going through. And of course, most dads either clam up or they're trying to make a joke or something to kind of cover up all the emotions you're feeling. And so so there we go. So that wound up in a little, a little short missive. It's not very long. <laughs> I'm going to make sure I pick that up. Um, 
Um, we're going to be going for a moment to hear from our sponsors, but when we come back, I would love for you to talk about your other book called Amber Dawn. How about that? Right. Okay, okay, great. Sounds good. So everyone, let's hear from our sponsors. Marianne Fairmont is a career consultant with 30 years experience in the national recruiting world, a multi-award winning author in multi-genres, and a speaker that gives presentations to help you succeed. Her book, Revolutionary Recruiting, made the top 20 global list of recruiting books. Find her on Amazon, your favorite bookstore, or at Fairmont.com. to embrace your children's imagination, check out Diane Floyd Bain's books for kids. There's The Moonling Adventures, all about the animals in the Serengeti. And then there's Harry the Camel, learning to love yourself just the way you are. And then The Little Girl in the Moon. There's one about friendship, another one about the big ideas, which is an inspirational story. And then Tour Tycho Town, right there in Tycho Crater on the Moon. All of Diane Floyd Bang's books are available at B4R Store. Hello, I am the author Denise Bryson. My first book is The Things That Crossed My Mind, Inspirational Poetry with Life Lessons. And then my audio book is Love's Reality. And it is also inspirational poetry with a jazzy flair. And then my new book is The Sex, The Lies, and The Soul Ties. They're really short stories uh, written from a poetic uh, expression. And then I have my first children book series, the Blinky series, which the first book is called Meet the Coins, and it is both in English and Spanish. And then the new book uh, from Coins, the bills. I am the author, Denise Bryson. Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Diane Floyd Bone on today's show. Welcome back, everyone. And we are with the wonderful author, Dr. Kenneth Andres. And he is going to be sharing with us maybe some of the backstory about his book, Amber at Dawn, and what also made him want to write this particular book for us. Okay, thank you. Well, Amber Dawn is a uh, is the second in a series of the five I'm writing. And, and this is just, I guess I started thinking about the theme of this story, you know, again, years ago. And so I kind of played it through my head and everything. And, and the premise is, is um, a, a Chechen who did all the right things. He went to the nuclear power school and, and got a PhD and everything in Moscow. And then in the battle of Grozny, when the Russians invaded Grozny, uh, his, fan, his wife and his young daughter were killed. And so he just sort of kind of went off the deep end. And, uh, and it's so uh, a story, almost two parallels, one of, of how he reacted to that and the impact. And then the other, of course, of the protagonist, Nick Parkos, who's kind of a constant in my stories. And Nick is, a, uh, is assigned by the, the uh, National Security Agency boss to chase this terrorist down. He was setting off dirty bombs. And, uh, and so this, Actually, the book sort of kind of also kind of backstory a little bit of my my learning experience in, in writing in that, uh, you know, the first story was it's I really like it still because it's, <laughs> it's in the South China Sea and everything I wrote about is coming true, which is sort of scary. But the second was was getting deeper in the characters. And and one 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 of the folks who commented on which I really like to this day said you know you can really get in these characters heads and said how can you do that how can you go from thinking as a protagonist and all of a sudden you're 180 degrees out and you're thinking about what is driving this this terrorist who's you know basically seeking revenge and so it's kind of a, a story of of how both of those progressed uh, the terrorist, you know, obviously is focused on extracting revenge against those who he thought was culpable and the Russians kill his family, which would be the, uh, the French, the Americans, the, uh, and some others. And so he's intent on going off and setting a dirty bomb in Paris uh, and one in ultimately in Miami where he meets up with my protagonist and they had their final climax. And uh, 
but that was sort of an interesting deal because it also got me into more into research because in these kind of books I write, and they're not really clancy like, I guess, but they're in that sort of that genre. And man, if you don't get your details right, uh, a lot of times your, your readers will just go, you know, and this this guy has any credibility and off it goes to the side and he grabs another one that actually makes, you know, technically makes sense. So in that sense, these books are about, you got your character arc, you got your story arc. And then of course, then you have what I call my technical underpinnings of all this to make sure you weave it all together. So this thing, started off on Moscow and and then it goes literally all over the world. It went to Karachi, Pakistan, uh, uh, Camp Liminar, Liminar in Djibouti, uh, to Rome, uh, to Paris, wow. and then to Miami. And so it literally spans like three continents and just a whole mess of uh, cities. And a lot of these places, except for Moscow, I've been to when I was with the Navy. And so that made it a little bit easier. So I was able to grab little pieces of backstory. So like mm -hmm. when my so when the uh, the my hero gets into Karachi, Pakistan, and, and or actually the uh, the, the antagonist uh, Bashir Al Kurtier arrives in, in Karachi, Pakistan, I was able to describe what it was like when my ship pulled into Karachi, Pakistan. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Point. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. And so, and of course, some of the places in Paris I'd gone to, and I say the place I did not go was Moscow and ever. And so I said, well, geez, what do you do? Well, there you go. We got Google and the internet and YouTube. So I went searching through there. And uh, and so one of the major sequences is in the Goom department store. That's a giant department store in Red Square right across from the Kremlin. And so this guy was in here with this camera, you know, walking around the Goom department store, taking all these pictures. And of course, then you can go online and you get the, the layout of the store. So you know exactly which all the stores were, what floor they were. So my my Colors car Cafe uh, was, it's actually there. So I was able to describe the, the cafe overlooking the entrance and a big fountain. And so that was actually sort of kind of fun. It's one of these deals when it said you want to, you know, some folks say you ought to write what you know. Um, William um, Martin, uh, another really mentor of mine, who writes some great historical novels about Washington and Lincoln, like the Lincoln letter. And, uh, and, and Bill says, you know, write what you want to know. Oh, I like that. Write what you want to know. Not, yeah, yeah. What you want to know, vice what you already know. And so wow. you're kind of expanding your own horizons. You do this, and uh, and and those of us who've been through this drill, and especially giving speeches and things, um, you wind up knowing more about any particular subject than the people you're going to be asking. So you actually learn more researching your book or researching a presentation than the people you're talking to would probably learn from what you're saying. So there's, um, so it's I, I so agree with that because in working myself with the historical fiction, um, as you said, credibility is everything. So you really have to understand what's going on in the times and the places and knowing your settings. And that's exactly what you're sharing is that you put a lot of research in behind your work, correct? Correct. And actually, you just touched on something since you like historicals and writing historical novels. That's when I'm done with this five novel series. That's going to be my 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 major work, I hope. <laughs> and it's going to be a historical novel about my namesake. Ah. And uh, Lieutenant John Andrews. And, and John Andrews crossed the pond, as they say, from Bristol, England uh, to the States. Actually, it wasn't the States then. Uh, in 1635. And the ship he was on, the Angel Gabriel, was actually caught in this huge hurricane in Pemquat, Maine, and sank. He made his way down the coast to the Ipswich, Massachusetts, wow. and just got all sorts of crazy adventures he got into, including, at the end of his life, the Salem Witch Trials. Turns yeah. out that the Proctors, who a lot of people still can remember from the Red Letter and things like that, the Proctors were good friends of his. So he managed to, to save his, the wife, but Mr. Proctor didn't make it. But he was also um, a bit of a rebel rouser, literally. So he was named as one of the founding fathers of the revolution, was imprisoned in Boston for sedition. I mean, so that's just fun. So I'm getting there and just, you know, already researching that stuff. And because you I want to get in that guy's head, you know, my answer is his head. You know, why did he why did people do what they did back in 1635? And what 
were the forces that guided their lives. You know, part of it, of course, was just plain survival. And uh, but what made him a rebel? Uh, he was involved in the Pequot Indian War. So what was the impact of his life from those? I mean, you're just a fascinating yeah. guy. It just so goes on and on, right? Yeah, I guess it's going on for this. So I guess I could talk about my my book to be. <laughs> no, I think it's I mean on and on in a positive way. It's exciting. Um, we will have to share notes because uh, my relatives came in 1632 to Long Island, so oh, we had some crossovers there. But we jumped ahead all the way. To <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so we have something offline to talk about as well. Now, yeah. you mentioned that you have several books in the pipeline, right? So is one a trilogy or? Well, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be five, and I'm pretty much carrying the wow. same characters through and when I, so the first one, of course, is Flashpoint. That was one set in the South China Sea. Number two is Amber Dawn. The third one that we hope to release in September, um, is the um, going to be called Arctic Menace, and that's another one of these uh, sort of my sort of political military novels, I guess. A lot of these things sort of have an underlying theme of political stuff going on, and how that impacts military. And so we're going to stop right oh, there, we're stop. and oh, we're going to oh, hold oh. everyone interested <laughs> about the political part of all of it because it is now time for our sponsors, and we'll be right back. <laughs> All right, drink time. Okay. Sorry to cut you off like that. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I don't have trouble talking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my husband uh, was a diplomat in the Philippines at one point, oh. and um, he was in the Department of Terrorism. So, and, oh my goodness, um, he first started <laughs> off at the State Department in D.C., and then we were sent to the Philippines. So. Um, when you start talking about the political part of my, oh my, my ears. Well, it's small world stuff. One of the uh, one of the staffers who met in the embassy of Wellington when my ship went in there is uh, named Anne Marie Casella, and Anne Marie wound up being a where did she go? She was in Eastern Europe, and then she went down into the Caribbean, and she's done all sorts of crazy stuff. And uh, so she was a she was a really interesting person, and. Uh, but the, were you guys in, in uh, Philippines or one of the... Uh, yeah, the Philippines and Manila. I mean, uh, Manila. Publishing marketing package for authors. A $1,500 value, save 40% now. Includes a six-piece marketing kit of 250 bookmarks, 250 business cards, 250 postcards, one table banner, one table runner, and 50 download cards. Plus, book cover design, ebook creation, PDF setups, upload to Ingram Spark, scroll placement, video commercial, and interview on IBS plus much more. Email bourgeoismedia at look.com for details or bourgeoismedia.com. Hi, I'm Mel Greenberg, author of Running With Our Eyes Closed, book one in the Empty Nested series. To the world, Samantha has the perfect life. Three wonderful children, a loving husband, so she thought, and a life split between Dallas and Italy. When her youngest leaves for college, it all comes crashing down, forcing Samantha to re-examine everything. Over seven days in one of the most romantic countries in the world, Samantha faces the past she thought she'd overcome and begins to redefine her role as a woman, a wife, and a mother. What would you do if you had to put your life on hold to care for a loved one? Well, during COVID, almost all of us have been doing just that. I'm Charlotte Canyon, award-winning author, actress, and speaker. And my book, you have to laugh to keep from crying, shows you how you can revive, thrive, and survive with four golden rules. You have to love one another. You have to respect one another. You have to have patience with one another. And most of all, you've got to forgive one another. I'm Charlotte Canyon, and I approve this message. Welcome to the Indie Beacon Show, where readers can discover great new indie authors. Find us on all major podcast systems and YouTube. Join Diane Floyd Bone on today's show. Welcome back, everybody. And now we are ready to get back to that cliffhanger about the political side of your book. Okay. The um, in Arctic Menace, one of the the premises on that thing is. Uh, 
rare earth elements. And uh, my, my publisher said, well, what's the big deal with rare earth elements? Well, anyway, they're the, they're the things that base us all of our, our current electronics, all the devices we have, uh, solar panels, electric car batteries, and all the military stuff, satellites, GPS, I mean, all that's based on rare earth elements. And so the premise is the, uh, the Chinese stumble across a deposit these off the coast of Alaska. Well, unbeknownst to my hero, who's dragged back into this thing after getting married and thought he was done with all this stuff, is in back in Washington. And it turns out that the Secretary of the Interior was corrupted by the Chinese. And, uh, and so, and some other folks from the State and Interior Department. And so part of this thing was unraveling what the heck was going on there. So besides the uh, chasing down the Chinese mastermind, my, my protagonist, Nick Parkos, is, is dealing with the, uh, the Chinese mastermind and trying to unravel what the heck is going on in the background. He, one of his really good friends that he worked with on the previous book on the al Qutir affair uh, betrayed him. And so... There's all that kind of stuff. And, and frankly, it's part of this idea from this one came back from years, years ago when, uh, when we may have bungled things and let the Russians get a hold of all of our uranium supplies. Mm -hmm. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, and so that, so that said, well, you know, hmm, why don't I get build a story around that? And of course, when you talk to authors, they'll be sitting around and, that, and these ideas are just kind of popping into their, their heads sort of how the blue, just a line from the news or something catches their interest and all of a sudden one or two sentences becomes a, you know, a 300 and some page novel. And it's amazing it's, how that it's, happens, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's really uh, interesting. So all these books I've got are sort of have that mixture of the political military stuff in there. Again, what is going on in the background that's driving this stuff? And of course, that's the the story arc. And then, of course, then it's the impact of what the heck is going on with the characters, the character arc, and how can you develop them so your, your reader doesn't sit there and just get a you know, big yawn halfway through this thing of a, of a techno thriller. And then the other thing I'm trying to do in these novels is dragging in some different characters. So one of my leading protagonists and one of the things is gay. Uh, and Arctic Menace, the, one of the main players is a, a woman helicopter pilot from the Coast Guard. Um, anyway, so I'm gradually trying to bring in some folks that I, I can understand. And now I don't want to just bring people in the story just to have them there because I would probably just screw it up. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm doing these things, I'll go and ask, you know, my friends and either a, a gay friend or my wife's military too. So I didn't have to do too much work in figuring out what the woman, woman <laughs> experiences <laughs> was in active duty. And, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's sort of kind of fun, kind of looking into this stuff and kind of digging a little deeper into things. It's into that storytelling stuff, I guess. That is great. So would you say your books really put the um, the reader into becoming the character? I feel like they're part of the action. Oh, I I certainly hope so. I guess we'll <laughs> we'll we'll find out. I'll have to, I'll have to go back and. Uh, Go back to another writing course I had in actually in Hawaii, and I had this breakout group, and I didn't have any idea what I was doing. And the two authors they co-hosted co this thing it was Jacqueline Mitchard and uh, and Karen Slaughter. Mm -hmm. Karen Slaughter did all the murder mystery things, and she's really a bestseller. And of course, Jackie, her first book was on Ophir Shore, you know, deep into the ocean. Yeah. I've still got my homework assignments from those two. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. I hung well, on to those. They, <laughs> Can you believe we are almost out of time? So um, in closing, is there any book title you want to make sure you get out to your uh, to the audience as well as share with us how people can order your books and maybe follow you online? Well, actually, there's if I can cheat and say two, I figured the first was kind of the wedding books. I'm really kind of proud of that. And, and, and clueless dads need to look at that. Uh, but the other one, I think, is Amber Dawn, because I think that was when I really did a good job of kind of working the characters. Um, so and then the next one is coming out. I hope I've done a combination. Um, the primary site for these books is just good old Amazon books. You just type in Kenneth Andrus and up pops my stories. And uh, that is great. And be for our bookstore. <laughs> yes. yes. And I've got, I've got a uh, my main website is probably on the um, 
Well, I've got you type in my name on the internet. And it comes up and my website will come up. Right. And I saw you, ha um, people can follow you on uh, Facebook as well. Facebook. And then uh, my publicist is doing some work with me on Twitter and, uh, and uh, what else? Instagram trying Instagram. to drag me into the 21st century. All the century. new stuff. Yes. Oh, we'll talk stuff. about that on. Oh. Yeah, for an old guy, that's uh, like, that's a poor thing. <laughs> well, there's no such thing as old in my book. It's all about uh, how youthful you feel in the mind and everything we have to bring. And with that, I want to share with you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know our listeners really learned a lot, are going to love reading your books. I know. I'm already thinking who I want to buy some in my family for Christmas. So I appreciate that. And I hope all the listeners start thinking about who they can get the books, not only for themselves, but for their loved ones as well, because there's nothing better than a great book to read. So with that, we will sign off and thank you to our sponsors. Have a great thank night, Dr. Kenneth. Thank you for watching or listening to The Indie Beacon Show, produced by Beyond Bourgeois for the Authors Marketing International LLC, copyright 2021. It's over by Beyond Bourgeois. If you would like to be a sponsor of the show, please email us at authorsmarketing at object.com. If you would like to be on the show, please complete the form found on our website at indiebeacon.com. You may also watch previous year's shows on the website. Music is Scholars of Words, created for Indie Beacon, 